everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic back again, and this time we are talking about full gear. Lots of big matches to get through in this one, from Hangman Adam Page taking on Kenny Omega for the AEW World Championship, to CM Punk versus Eddie Kingston, and many, many more as well. So, let's get straight to it. Without any further ado, this is what happened at AEW Full Gear 2021. First, on the pre-show, we get Tony Schiavone introducing Dante Martin to the ring, asking him if he is indeed going to accept the offer and join Team Taz. Before Dante can give his answer, he is cut off by the acclaimed, not in the game, but the acclaimed. Uh, and one of Max Caster's bars is actually very funny. He says something like, you don't belong in this environment, we're gonna send Leo Rush into his 15th retirement, which I thought was really good. But unfortunately, Leo Rush wasn't there uh, at the show because his grandmother sadly passed away. So best wishes, of course, to Leo Rush. The acclaimed try to convince Dante Martin to join them and say that if he doesn't, they're going to break his legs and send him home, just like his brother. Ooh, this does not please Dante Martin, of course, and he beats them up and does a big dive off the top rope, so that's that's fun. Uh, and then, yeah, that's that's pretty much that. The only match on the pre-show is Thunder Rosa and Hikaru Shida teaming up to take on Nyla Rose and Jamie Hayter. It's a fairly standard tag team match until at one point, Shida gets into it, well, an argument really, with Serena Deeb in the front row. This distracts her and Vicky Guerrero comes in from behind with a kendo stick shot. But it's not enough to turn the tide of the match because it's Hikaru Shida who gets the pinfall with a, kind of a jackknife bridging sort of pinning attempt on Nyla Rose. And the final bit of the pre-show to talk about, we head backstage where Orange Cassidy is being interviewed and he has a tag match against the Butcher and the Blade next week with a partner of his choosing. And he says, well, my best friends are all kind of working really hard and I feel like I might give them the night off, but I might choose somebody from a certain faction in Japan and maybe he'll bring one of his dogs, he says. Is that indeed a reference to the Stone Pitbull Tomohiro Ishii? And it is indeed later confirmed that Tomohiro Ishii will indeed be on Dynamite alongside Orange Cassidy. Wow, that's, that's pretty big. We start things off with what was honestly an excellent match between MJF and Darby Allen. MJF early on goes for the headlock takeover, as promised, saying that he could beat Darby Allen with a headlock takeover, and things develop into a very technical opening with lots of counters, and it's, it's very much the case that Darby is MJF's equal. Darby misses a coffin drop and lands on the apron, which allows MJF to take control, but he hurts his knee, giving Darby a backbreaker, which would be quite crucial throughout the match. MJF goes for a tombstone off the middle rope, as you do, but Darby flips out into a stunner. He goes for another coffin drop, but MJF rolls away. MJF then takes control with finger biting and an eye poke, and that's, you know, classic heelish stuff. He gets a sharpshooter locked in, but Darby counters by repeatedly attacking the injured knee. He continues to attack the knee and gets a figure four, but MJF rolls over and Darby has to grab the ropes. MJF hits a tombstone on the apron, but again hurts his knee on the landing, and both men roll to the outside and almost get counted out. We then get lots of exchanged pinfall attempts rolling around the ring, and Darby nails a nice code red, which MJF kicks out of amazingly, like a really dramatic near fall. It was awesome. Darby again goes for the coffin drop, but MJF rolls to the outside, so Darby predictably just does it to the outside instead because he's very fearless. Uh, back inside, he goes for another coffin drop, but MJF gets the knees up. At this point, Sean Spears and Wardlow head down to try and cause a bit of trouble, but Sting fights them off to a huge pop with the baseball bat. Back in the ring, MJF gets Darby's skateboard and tells him to hit him with it so MJF would win by DQ. Darby thinks better of it though and hands it off to the referee, but as the ref turns away, MJF gets the dynamite diamond ring out of his tights, nails Darby in the head with it, and then as promised, wins the match with a headlock takeover. Oh, MJF, what are you like? Next up, it's the Lucha Bros defending the AEW Tag Team titles against FTR. FTR, in quite a nice touch actually, are wearing one Stars and Stripes knee pad and one Mexican flag knee pad because of course, they are the AAA Tag Team Champions. There's a big brawl to start and this one is heated. And then I think the Lucha Bros do another tag inside the ring without one of them being on the apron, which they've done before. And I'm like, come on guys. I don't stay angry for long though because Phoenix starts to do some amazing Phoenix things on the ropes as he likes to do. We get some unique spots. Phoenix at one stage, Monkey Flip, 
flips Penta into a cannonball on both men in the corner. Uh, the crowd really come alive for that one. They also do a very unique sort of submission chain kind of thing, which Owen will pop on screen for you now. Thanks, Owen. Penta goes for a 10 count in Spanish, of course, but gets dropped across the top rope. And then Cash, sneakily behind the referee's back, ties his mask to the bottom rope and Dax puts the boots to him until the ref can get him free. More heelish stuff from FTR, like Cash distracting the ref to make him miss the hot tag to Phoenix and frustrate the Lucha Brothers. But finally, Phoenix gets that hot tag and runs wild. Or at least he does so until he gets clocked with a belt shot from the outside and kicks out. Wow, kicking out of a belt shot. That is pretty rare, I think. FTR go for the big rig, but Penta tags in as Phoenix hits the ropes and Penta prepares to finish off Dax, but then Tully Blanchard grabs his leg from the outside. This allows Dax Harwood to mockingly hit the three amigos, but Penta comes back with some of his own. The Eddie tributes continue as Phoenix gets a big near fall of a huge frog splash. FTR retake control and hit a spike pile driver and Phoenix kicks out of that too. What the hell's going on? Phoenix is kicking out of everything. We then get a crazy move where Phoenix delivers the fear factor and bounces over Dax and his own tag team pod into a move on Cash Wheeler on the other side. It's hard to explain it. It was insane though, but again, it's only a near four. FTR put the Super Rana's masks on to try and fool the referee and kind of do twin magic because the, it allows the fresher man, Cash Wheeler, to be the legal man, even though he's not. The referee doesn't catch that somehow, even though you can see his hair and tattoos, but he does catch an illegal rope-assisted pinfall attempt. Finally, the Lucha Bros hit one final double-team move. It's enough to pin Cash and retain the titles, while I guess leaving the door open as well for a rematch because... FTR could technically argue that the wrong man got pinned. This was another very good match in general, although I do think maybe it should have ended one or two spots earlier. It, there was a lot of kickouts, but still a very fun match indeed. We're not slowing down for a second though, because the next match is Brian Danielson versus Miro, with the winner becoming the number one contender. The story early on is Miro's power versus Brian's technique, and Miro seems very in control early on, even almost getting a count out victory. They head to the outside again, and Brian hits a running knee off the apron, and then back inside hits some yes kicks. Miro counters that, but Brian turns into a knee bar. Miro comes very close to tapping out, but stands up out of the submission and suplexes Brian. Danielson fights back and gets in control of the match again. He goes for the running knee, but Miro catches him in midair and nails a powerbomb. The game over is locked in, but Brian bravely reaches the ropes. So Miro just goes for it again, but this time Brian rolls backwards for a two count and then gets to the bell lock locked in. Miro again powers out of that and rains down big elbows from the top, but Brian catches one and locks in a sleeper with added elbows. So Miro has to gouge the eyes to break it. They have a big strike exchange with Miro asking for more kicks and not selling them and then firing back with harder kicks of his own. He then takes Danielson up top, but Brian fights back with elbows and hits an avalanche DDT before immediately locking in a submission. But the referee realizes that Miro is out cold and calls for the bell. Brian Danielson is the number one contender, and it's another great match. Three amazing matches in a row, but all very different and distinct in their own way. So a really strong start for AEW. And the action still doesn't slow down because the next match is the Falls Count Anywhere six-man match between the Young Bucks and Adam Cole, the Super Click, and Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and Christian Cage. The Young Bucks are incredibly pink in this one. The gear is, I'd say, offensively loud. Um, maybe it's fuchsia. Is that fuchsia? It's really pink. This match has everything and then some. Uh, there's a chair that's involved, a trash can gets involved. Who doesn't love a trash can in pro wrestling? Uh, tables, ladders, you name it. Like, it was in this match. Pretty early on, Cole is busted open with a chair, actually, and Christian prepares for a concerto, but then hands the chair to Jungle Boy and say, like, you know, you're feuding with him. You should do it yourself. Uh, this delay, though, allows the Young Bucks to save Cole and dominate the match. Then the tables come out as Jungle Boy puts Cole through one with a running Hurricane Rana to the outside, so Matt Jackson elbow drops Luchasaurus through another. Christian brawls with Nick Jackson high into the stands and fights off Nakazawa and Cutler who try to interfere, and then dives off an entranceway onto all three. Go on, Christian! Back in the ring, Jungle Boy is now isolated and the heels get thumbtacks. They put them in his mouth and super kick him, but Christian saves the day, breaking up the pinfall attempt at two. Luchasaurus, just at this point, absolutely ruins Adam Cole's day into a ladder, uh, slams Nick Jackson onto it as well, but then Matt Jackson goes crazy on Luchasaurus with a trash can. Uh, Luchasaurus doesn't care because he's a, a big dinosaur and sits up, so Matt Jackson hits a super kick. 
and Luchasaurus kicks out at one. The fight spills up onto the ramp. Matt's diving off the ramp onto Luchasaurus. Cole's hitting a little hop down Panama Sunrise off the entranceway. Uh, not off the entire entranceway. That would be absolutely insane. Uh, and the heels are generally dominating now. There's the super kicks for everybody. They even put on some thumbtack knee pads and hit a three-man BTE trigger on Luchasaurus. But again, the pinfall is broken up. Jungle Boy is now alone. Cole and the Bucks stare him down, but his friends are there and they've got his back, everybody. Friendship's super important, uh, which Luchasaurus demonstrates by hitting a really friendly shooting star press off the ramp. What a visual that is. Now, Matt Jackson is all alone and at the mercy of the good guys. Christian gives Jungle Boy the steel chair and finally he nails that concerto and picks up the win. Yeah, this was a breathless encounter. Uh, largely enjoyable though, in my opinion. Uh, your mileage may vary depending on how much you like this style of match, I guess. It's a very serious ending to the match in tone and oh wait, never mind. Oh, 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 oh. Next, we have Cody Rhodes and Pac taking on Malachi Black and Andrade El Idolo. And when Cody makes his entrance, he's just got so much pyro, like it has to be deliberate. He also gets booed early on for blind tagging himself in. So Pac blind tags himself right back in and gets cheered for it. At one stage, Cody and Andrade battle on the apron. So Andrade's assistant, Jose, grabs Cody's leg. So Cody gets revenge a little bit later on by hitting a nice suicide dive onto Jose. Cody hits the Cody cutter on Malachi and maybe thinks about a pedigree. He's got the double underhooks. We don't we don't ever really find out. Pac blind tags himself in again, and Cody takes a black mass. On the outside, Jose foolishly picks a fight with Arn Anderson and just gets battered, so well done, Jose. Back in the ring, Pac is beaten down for a while as the heels take control, but then the heels now argue over who should be the legal man, and Pac takes advantage, getting the hot tag to Cody which is, of course, booed. Cody puts a figure four leg lock on Andrade, but Pac again blind tags himself in and hits a 450 splash, but Andrade grabs the ropes at the count of two. More miscommunications as Pac accidentally dives onto Cody when Malachi Black pulls him in the way, and then Black boots Cody into the front row. This leaves Pac and Andrade to duke it out one-on-one -on -one in the ring, and Pac gets the better of him, hitting a poison runner and nailing the Black Arrow for the one, two, three. But it's not all quite over yet, as after the match, Cash Wheeler runs in to attack both both Cody and Pac, a continuation of FTR being loaned out by MJF to the heels. But I do wonder actually if this means that Dax Harwood is maybe injured. Hopefully he's okay. It, it didn't really make sense that it was just Cash out there two on one. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully Dax Harwood is all right. Next, we have the AEW women's title match with Dr. Britt Baker DMD taking on the challenger Ty Conti. Ty has special Brazil flag makeup, which is awesome, but Brit doesn't get outdone because she has a special entrance with the guitarist from Fozzy. There's a heated exchange to start and a big head-to-head -head stare down, and Brit largely dominates the early stages, but there are glimpses of hope for Conti. Brit retakes control and gets the glove for Lockjaw, but Conti fights back and they battle on the apron, uh, and Brit hits a nice air raid crash on the apron, and Conti rolls to the outside. Back in the ring, Ty manages to avoid the Lockjaw and hits the Ty KO, but it only gets two. She then hits an amazing Gotch-style pile driver, which also only gets two. Rebel distracts the referee while Jamie Hayter drags tie out of the ring and throws her into the ring steps and then Britt Baker goes over and kind of stomps her onto the top step which is really cool but it doesn't work it's not enough because when Britt gets her back in the ring and goes for the lockjaw again Ty manages to avoid it that time too. Britt goes to the outside so Conti heads up top and hits a moonsault onto Rebel and Jamie Hayter but Britt manages to get out of the way. Back in the ring though Ty manages to hit the DD Ty but it's only enough for two again. Britt manages to finally get lockjaw applied but Ty rolls her over for a two count but then Britt rolls her back and gets the three. Britt Baker is still the AEW Women's Champion, but really I think the story of this match as well was an awesome showing by Ty Conti. Next, it's time for the grudge match between Eddie Kingston and CM Punk. Punk's entrance is interesting in this one. There's no frills, he doesn't shout it's clobber in time, he just marches straight to the ring and stares down Eddie. They argue before the bell with the referee trying to get in the middle, so Eddie just nails Punk with the back fist even before the, the match has begun. The ref checks on a groggy Punk who tells Kingston to bring it on, the bell rings, and then they just start brawling. And that's pretty much the story of this match. It was a very hard-hitting, exciting, and largely very fast-paced affair. There are still shots from both men and Punk at one point is busted wide open and Eddie 
wipes the blood on his own face because he's, oh, he's just mean, yeah. At one stage, CM Punk starts doing John Cena's Five Moves of Doom, a reference, I guess, to the fact that people have been saying that in this feud, Punk is like the Cena and Kingston is like the Punk. But when he gets up to where the five knuckle shuffle would usually be, he just flips Kingston off instead. He flips him off right back and they continue to just hit each other very hard. Punk hits the three amigos in a nice tribute again to uh, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, then there's more brawling and Eddie Kingston mocks the go to sleep taunt, but it's Punk who hits the go to sleep out of nowhere, but he's too woozy to make the pinfall. They both wobble back to their feet and Eddie goes for the back fist, but both men collapse uh, and they're really selling the effects of the strikes in this match. Uh, Punk grabs Eddie, MMA strikes left, right, and center. He hits quite a few knees as well, and eventually hits another go to sleep, and that's enough for the three count. After the match, you can tell the Punk is really putting over Eddie strong, even though Eddie lost the match. He's collapsing when the referee tries to help him up. He's still very wobbly, but eventually both men get to their feet, and Punk offers Eddie a handshake, but Kingston just walks away. This was an awesome match, definitely one of my favorites of the night, not just because it was excellent, but it was different in tone as well from anything else on the show. Next, we have the Minneapolis street fight between the Inner Circle and American Top Team, or Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page, and American Top Team. Now, there are tags in this match, which is a little bit weird for a street fight, but don't worry, it does break down eventually. At the start, however, everybody gets a little chance to fight, uh, to have a bit of singles, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of action. Andre Orlovsky looks decent. Junior Dos Santos busts out a standing moonsault. Whoa! Dan Lambert comes in to take advantage of a weakened Chris Jericho at one point, but this is when it all breaks down into a big brawl. Ethan Page is using a hockey stick on the outside. Jake Hager's jumping off the top onto every everybody outside as well. Suddenly everybody's using weapons while Jericho is trying to chase down Dan Lambert with a big print symbol because Minneapolis. He can't get Lambert straight away though and the heels retake control. Uh, but then Santana and Ortiz start to take control of the match instead and do another weird chain submission like in a, a few matches ago. Oh, and please put that on screen there because I can't begin to describe what that even is. Sammy Guevara launches an American football at Scorpio Sky as well for good measure. And then Jake Hager's using a toaster uh, and Jericho's using a water ski. <laughs> We're all having a great time. Dos Santos takes a double superplex from Proud and Powerful, which is well taken by him. Uh, Sammy Guevara on the outside scales a huge ladder and swanton bombs off it onto Scorpio Sky through a table. Ethan Page hits a razor's edge and then stops to taunt Jake Hager's wife in the front row, but she happens to be next to Baron Von Raschke, who puts on the iron claw. Ethan, you silly boy. Dan Lambert thinks he's alone in the ring and safe, but Jericho's there and finally has him. He goes for the lion salt, but Dos Santos hits him from the outside and Lambert covers him for two. Lambert goes for the walls of Jericho, which he promised to win the match with, but Jericho grabs a kendo stick and just goes to town on him for a while. He also also puts a stapler onto his balls and uh, and then in a very nice touch actually points to the sky scales the top row and hits a frog splash in tribute to Eddie Guerrero for the one two three you know that was quite fun I don't really know why it was on the same show as the the Bucks match but you know even though the matches were similar they were kind of different as well this one was a little bit more silly apart from that very poignant ending and before the main event we do have a special guest as well Tony Schiavone introduces none other than Jay Lethal. Tony asks Jay why he's here, and Jay says he's found the hidden forbidden door, and it's official. He is all elite. And not only that, but Lethal says he wants Sammy Guevara for the TNT title on Wednesday night. Uh, Sammy actually comes out because he's just had his match, and even though he's all banged up, he very much agrees, and they have a stare down, and that should be a really good match, to be fair. Finally, we get the main event. Kenny Omega defending the AEW World Championship against Hangman Adam Page. This one's intense to start. Lots of intense chops. Don Callis is grabbing Hangman's leg from the outside, choking him over the rope while the referee's distracted by Kenny. It's, it's It feels big. At one point, Omega thinks about stealing the buckshot lariat, it looks like, but he doesn't do it. And Hangman fires up and hits a nice dive to the outside, followed by a big moonsault. They trade big moves back and forth in the ring, and Hangman is only just able to kick out of a Tiger Driver 98. But he does regain control of the match later on with a huge avalanche fall away slam so Kenny rolls out of the ring to avoid a pinfall attempt so Hangman climbs up to the top of the ring post leaps off and puts Kenny through the timekeeper's table. He sets up for the buckshot lariat back in the ring but Kenny stumbles out of range so Hangman steals Kenny's taunt and, and goes for the V trigger but Kenny moves, Hangman manages to counter his move and then hits a pop up power bomb, goes for the buckshot lariat again but Kenny pulls the referee in the way and the referee goes down. That means of course that Don Callis gets in the ring with the title belt looking to clock Hangman 
Hangman with it, but Hangman catches him and just decks him with a big right hand. So Kenny grabs the title belt, misses, Hangman hits the dead eye, covers him, but obviously the referee is down. Aubrey Edwards sprints out to a huge pop, counts two, but Kenny kicks out at the last second. Hangman, for a moment, considers maybe using the belt or perhaps is just looking at it longingly, but he puts it down in either case. And Kenny regains control of the match with lots of knees and some Kawada kicks as well. But Hangman fires up, gets right in his face and asks, is that all he's got? And then takes Kenny's head off with a huge lariat. At this stage, it seems like the match is turning in Hangman's favor. Uh, and out come the Young Bucks limping from their big loss earlier on. Uh, but they don't get involved at all. They don't interfere on Kenny's behalf as we thought they might do. They just stand and watch instead. Hangman goes for the buckshot again, Kenny counters with a big V-trigger, goes for the one-winged angel, but Hangman slips out the back, scoops up Kenny, and hits the one-winged angel himself, but Kenny Omega kicks out a two. Out of all the people we thought were going to kick out the one-winged angel, I don't think many would have guessed that it would be Kenny himself. Hangman, though, is undeterred. He gets on the apron and with Nick Jackson looking on, hits a buckshot lariat to the back of Kenny Omega's head. Then he gets on the other side of the ring and with Matt Jackson looking on and giving him a little nod as well, Hangman hits a standard buckshot lariat, covers Kenny Omega. One, two, three. And finally, Hangman Adam Page is the AEW world champion. The celebrations are real, you know, Shawn Michaels' boyhood dream has finally come true kind of stuff. You know, Hangman's cradling the belt, the crowd are chanting, you deserve it. The Dark Order come out on stage and, and applaud him from there, but Hangman calls them down into the ring. Uh, they get in there, offer him a beer, and in a lovely moment, he, he goes, no, that's not important, knocks it away, and just embraces them in a big group hug. And that's how the show ends, with Hangman Adam Page on the shoulders of the Dark Order, celebrating becoming the new AEW World Champion. And you can't argue that he doesn't deserve it. What a story they've just told. But there's potential interesting developments in the future as well. Like, why were the Young Bucks so accepting of Hangman beating Kenny? Why did Matt Jackson give Hangman a little nod? Are they going to potentially, as many people have guessed, kick him out of, of the Elite and replace him with maybe Adam Cole as the new leader? We'll have to wait and see, but there are a lot of different avenues that they could go down from here. So that's it, uh, a, a really packed show. They got a lot of stuff in here. Not a lot between the matches, but the matches were pretty much all given a decent amount of time and largely, I think, were really, really good. This was a very enjoyable show in my opinion, but what did you think? Do let me know in the comments section down below. And thanks very much for watching. I've been Jack and that was what happened at All Elite Wrestling Full Gear 2021.